Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about problematic internet gaming and ADHD. As usual, I'm going to start with the take-home message for probably 20, 25 minutes, and I'll be available for questions and answers at the end. And I'm actually going to give a preface before I start with the take-home message. This is a so, so I put out internet gaming, problematic internet gaming and ADHD because it's a more discrete topic. I was hoping to explore a much bigger topic of internet use, social media use, screen time. And so many of the studies chop and mix and match and combine or only look at some segments of it. So I thought it was cleaner to try to break out the internet gaming first and I'll be returning to a related topic in two weeks. So the take home message is that there is a very strong, it's not completely clear how strong, but very strong association between problematic gaming and ADHD. Um, problematic gaming is, I would say, on the verge of being officially by the DSM considered an addiction disorder. It's been proposed, there's still work that needs to be done, but there has been growing consensus to include it in the next manual. Um, some of that was, the, the stage for that was sort of set by including gambling, and I may occasionally misspeak gaming and gambling during this time, I'll try not to. So gambling was the first non-substance item that was officially listed as an addiction disorder, and that's paved the way for including other behavioral phenomena. Um, so even though there's a strong association, it is not clear whether it's primarily that problematic internet gaming drives ADHD or causes it, or whether ADHD is causing a source or reason why people fall into problematic internet gaming patterns, or whether there's some confounding factor X, not anything to do with Twitter, um, that is causing both ADHD and problematic gaming to be present in the same individuals. So we are still working in defining the, how we define problematic gaming, but currently most of the definitions intentionally a list of behaviors that align closely with the substance abuse disorders. So I'm gonna talk first about those behaviors and then be clear parallels between the neurochemistry and neuro and anatomy and neuroconnectivity between other substance disorders and problematic gaming. So problematic gaming is defined as excessive gaming that is interfering with other activities and functions like school, work, or social functioning. So no clear decision yet on how long this pattern has to be going on. But again, this has to be a pervasive pattern, which is causing serious disruption. So briefly binging on your favorite video game when the newest version comes out, even if you're doing that for a day or two, would not qualify for a severe, for an internet or gaming internet problematic gaming addiction. Um, and in the studies that have been looked at, which are males are predominant in this, and it's particularly young males, 12 to 20, but people as old as in their 70s and 80s have been in studies for this, so it's not only something happening in the young, but these people are spending on average eight to 10 hours a day in their gaming. So in addition to interfering with regular functioning and activities, um, tolerance. So people need to be spending more and more time to get the same thrill or enjoyment out of the game. Um, withdrawal effects. So when you deprive the person of access to their game, they either become depressed, anxious, angry, irritable, um, so withdrawal symptoms. Um, four is that they abandon past sources of joy or things they used to participate in and like. Um, some of this is a little tricky because again, the age work group we're talking about is adolescence where there's a fair amount of leaving past behaviors behind and you know, things that six-year-olds and 10-year-olds do, most 14 and 50-year-olds give up anyway as, as, as sign of maturation. So abandoning past sources of joy is one symptom, but that can be tricky in this age group. Um, 
where am I? Floor five, unsuccessful attempts to quit or to reduce use. So as with substances, someone's aware there's a problem and cuts back um, or tries to, but isn't able to. Um, using gaming as in a way to alleviate stress or to alleviate low mood. Now, again, if you got a bad grade on a paper and you decide to spend two hours playing a video game because you know that makes you happy, that would be compatible with this, but unless that's a regular routine way of dealing with all your sorrows and you don't eventually really address them in any other way, then it's problematic. But again, just occasional or doing that on a one-time basis does not make you an addict. Um, declining personal hygiene has been noted in many people. Um, and again, I, I might not have said this, problematic internet gaming use is predominantly, and studies vary, but it's not exclusively, but hugely a male phenomena, again, younger males. And the last behavioral symptom is continuing use, even when you're aware that it's causing problems in your life. So that maps nicely with all the symptoms for a substance use disorder. And again, they're, they're, they are all there in this problematic gaming addiction disorder. So at the neurochemical level and at the neuroanatomic and connectivity level. So one, what do we find? We find disruptions of dopamine systems, just as we do with substance use disorders. So in general, there is lower D2, dopamine 2 receptor density in the striatum. There is lower activity at a ongoing basis, but increased activity in anticipation of reward or for a cue, just like we see in substance abuse issues. Um, we, in terms of activa activation or how of different brain centers, we have decreased activation in areas of involved in impulse control in the forebrain, um, decreased activity in areas involved in decision-making. We have overall decreases in gray matter, that's cell nerve cell body, and decreases in the integrity of white matter tracts, which are the connections that have bundles of axons and connecting one part of the brain to another. Um, so particularly decreased connectivity to frontal areas that are involved in executive functions, um, decreased connectivity to areas that are involved in impulse and impulse control, involved in emotional regulation, um, diminished, and, and so now I'm moving to some of the psychometric, not just anatomic, decreased um, ability to say, sustain attention. Again, um, poor recognition of emotions in others, and again, poor control of emotions, poor regulation, decreases in memory, um, poor impulse control. So, one is a lot of that, again, overlaps the neurochemistry, neuroanatomy that we're seeing in substance abuse, but there's also a huge overlap with ADHD. So in several meta-analyses, so these are taking several to dozens of other studies, one recent meta-analysis of problematic gaming showed that ADHD was one of the most common comorbid conditions. Um, alcohol abuse was the highest. So alcohol abuse was three times, more than three times higher in the problematic gaming group than in the control population. ADHD was the second most common. And this, again, this is a meta-analysis looking at more than a dozen different studies. More than 22% of the people in the problematic gaming group had ADHD and notable increases as well in depression and anxiety. Um, some of the previous meta-analyses, again, not just a single study, but looking at collection of number of studies, found rates of ADHD as high as 100% for people with problematic gaming. Of note, that meta-analysis was looking primarily at studies done in Asian cultures. This is one of the few mental health conditions where rates in Asian countries, and we're not randomly looking at all of Asia, very little is coming out of China itself, but Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea, Japan, 
predominantly, not, not the only ones, but that's, so these are industrialized Asian countries, um, tend to show rates of problematic gaming higher than in European countries. Um, and again, higher overlap with ADHD in those cultures than maybe in European and American cultures. So again, we have a strong association and it's reasonable to think that ADHD could be driving these behaviors because hallmarks of ADHD are poor. I mean, ADHD is associated with a whole range of increased substance use disorders, largely tied with impulse control, with delayed discounting. So people are more aware of the rewards in the moment and less likely to take into account any detrimental effects in the long run that could come from this. There's some with, with general substance abuse, there's also some indication that inattentive ADHD factors can be contributory. Um, so if you are paying less attention when all your classmates are being lectured on different ways drugs can rot your brain or the risks of internet addiction and you're busy playing with your Pokemon cards, you haven't heard the warning. So both inattentive and hyperactive, impulsive, all three can could be contributing to increased rates of ADHD. Um, so ADHD could be driving problematic gaming behavior in that way. Part of the problem in sorting out, which is you know, what's cause and what's effect is that by and far the largest number of studies are just correlational. So looking at a group of people, seeing what rate of ADD is in the population, seeing how much internet use, how much gaming use, how much other social media, how much other screen time and looking for correlations Correlations can't tell you what's cause and what's effect. Um, but it's, I'd, I'd say there's logical reasons to presume that ADHD could be driving, could be the major reason for the association that it's driving problematic gaming behavior. But there's a fair amount of research and thinking about problematic gaming behavior driving ADHD. And some of this is based on compared to the media use. So when I was little, you know, that's half a century ago, um, but there's been a huge change in the stimuli that people are filling their brains with. So one is with internet gaming, operational speed, you know, things happen much more quickly. There's much more scene shifting, much more act movement, activity, action, plot, everything is happening at a measurably faster rate. Um, two, things aren't just faster, but the level of stimulation. I mean, if you started playing computer games when Pac-Man or Tetris or um, Wumpus was you know, an, an early game where you just had little symbols on your computer screen doing things, and now you have 3D appearing colorful images. So the level of stimulation has gone up astronomically. Um, the amount of exposure time has gone up. So yes, in the old days, some people, and still now, keep their television on you know, all their waking hours, but people aren't sitting fixed in front of the television staring at it, whereas people who are gaming on their phone, on their tablet, on their desktop, are often in many more hours a day exposure to these media. Um, and exposure, not just time per day, but starting at much earlier ages. So you know, there are many studies looking at kids who are already being parked at one or two for hours in front of their digital devices. And one of the bugaboo of certain groups is measurably much more violence in these um, on internet gaming than there was in past media entertainment and exposure. So there's a host of different theories. Again, most of these are theories with little ability for us to test them from most of the available studies as to why problematic gaming or media exposure could be driving ADHD. So one is, two of them are just based on this increased violence. So if you're watching more violence, inherently humans are violence averse. Yes, we may engage in violence and war and other things, but most of the time we don't like conflict, we avoid it. That's objectively measurably so. And when we, see it, 
we're aroused. It triggers our sympathetic nervous system. So constant arousal, constant overactivation of noradrenergic and other stimulatory sympathetic nervous system pathways could indeed contribute to the development of ADHD. Um, another way violence itself could lead to greater HD is just a what's called the violence script approach. So if you are watching media where all the time people are being hurt, people are being harmed, things are moving quickly, separate from being aroused at the moment, you are training your brain to expect changes and expect changes for the worst. And that may make you, this, some of these theories overlap or into one of the next ones, which is called the scan and shift training approach. So again, much more cutting of action, much more jumping scene to scene. That is training your brain to shut down sustained attention. You don't need to practice sustained attention because the scene is going to change in a few seconds. So again, that's one other potential way gaming and other media, modern media exposure could be triggering or could be training brains to develop in an ADHD-like way. Um, another different, slightly different aspect is that that fast-paced arousal that we habituate to it, so that's slightly different than it's training us, but that we to, to shut down our attention, but that we are just habituated and see it so much that our own systems shut down. Um, another set of theories is displacement. If we're spending on average and, and some of the recent studies four or five hours a day on locked onto your phone with social media or a couple hours watching television or watching shows on, on your screen and or playing games. And again, for Western or at least North American, four hours in some studies has been close to an average. That's just simply time you're not looking at other people's faces, you're not talking to them. So some of this may just be a displacement that you are depriving yourself of what for millennia have been normal human interactions. And then more specifically along those lines is the language deficit. So measurably kids who are parked in front of their um, screens starting at age one or two have impairments in language. And again, that could be, it could be the parents who are least likely to be teaching their kids language anyway, or you know, the, the kids may be genetically, they may be physiologically programmed not to be picking up language well, or it could be again, this active alternative. You're spending time on things that aren't language focused. You're not gonna get the practice you need at an early age. So there's actually a, at least a few studies that, again, these are not proof, um, but they are suggestive. So one study, and again, this one looked at more than just internet gaming, it looked at total um, multimedia engagement, how many hours a day. And the good thing is that they looked, so this was done in adolescence, they looked at um, hours a day spent on multimedia and, and checked it as a spectrum. So it wasn't just high or low or middle. And they looked at ADHD symptoms. And the good thing is that they didn't just categorize ADHD or not. They counted ADHD symptomatology. And what they found is if you followed kids across two years, um, the, high, the kids with the most exposure to multimedia, um, including internet gaming, at the end of those two years, were more likely to have ADHD than the low exposure group. And again, given that they measured ADD as a spectrum and not a yes or no, it wasn't just that they were missing people who were just below the cutoff at the beginning point. It wasn't a huge increase, but it was about a 10% increase. Um, so again, there's some mildly suggestive research that that internet gaming and other multimedia use can be driving the development of ADHD. And then again, the, the third set of, or could be much, the only two, we don't have just two options. It's not just ADHD is causing problematic gaming or problematic gaming is causing ADHD. Um, it could just be that both are manifestations of a third process that's going on. So let's just say the third process is Messed up dopamine in the striatum could be driving ADHD and it could be driving people to develop internet gaming addictions and other addictions. So 
we need. And, and some of the studies that would be ideal to do if you wanted as a scientist, we're not ever going to be able to do. We're not going to say, okay, we're going to raise these 20 kids from birth without any internet attention and then and just select them randomly. So there are families and practices that do that, but already they are outliers on a number of other different variables. Um, so we're not going to randomly choose a bunch of kids one way and then expose them to different amounts of internet gaming and then see what the outcomes are five, 10 years down the road. So that's about all I have to say today. Um, I will, next week's topic is gonna to be Wellbutrin, Bupropion and ADHD. And then two weeks from now, I'm gonna get back to other aspects of multimedia, social internet and impact on ADHD. And I do see there are several questions, so I will try to go through those. So. Thanks for your attention so far and hello, Dennis. Welcome home. So Dennis is sharing his own individual experience where he was diagnosed with ADHD and has definitely wasted a ton of time on games, movies, and TV during college. So he did survive and got through so far, but it's constantly trying to tell myself to get my shit together. Um, so I didn't touch on it all. How do you deal with this? So. And, and this is mostly looking at internet, compulsive internet or problematic internet gaming, not necessarily just in a setting of ADHD, but again, the huge overlap. Cognitive behavior therapy seems to be the basis of the most successful or at least the programs that have done the most studies. Um, and there are certainly cognitive behavioral approaches for ADHD. Um, so, I would imagine, yes, it will continue to be a struggle. And I didn't acknowledge one other piece of the struggle is that very consciously, very explicitly, you know, directly hiring psychologists in there, the game developing company industry wants you to be addicted. That's how they get you to buy you the device. That's how they get you to spend time streaming. That's how they get you to buy tokens and games and avatars and multi I'm not even remembering the right term, multi-character interactional games. Um, they know what's addictive and they are good at sticking that in these games and programs. So it, it will be a constant battle. Um, some of the most simplistic approaches, and they work, are you can buy apps, you can lock yourself out of your phone, your other devices for periods of time if there aren't other behavioral ways you can control it. I mean, sometimes, I mean, a cardinal one is putting away your phone and putting it in a different room where it's not easily accessible when you're trying to go to bed. If that phone is near you, you're going to be likely, particularly if you're having some trouble falling asleep or wake up in the middle of the night to move over to it. Um, so YouTube playlist says, I used to love video games, especially story-driven character-based games. Now I can't stand playing any game except simulation games like truck driver. Um, yeah, so tastes can change and you know, um, so, so the other thing that's encouraging is that again, there does seem to be a strong preponderance of males and young males, but it sucks just, just as with substance abuse even without explicit treatment, many people do outgrow some of these propensities. Um, so Dennis, again, ironically, the FDA approved a video game for ADHD called Endeavor RX. There's an actual lance of paper that led to the FDA approval. Um, I actually have a talk on that somewhere I wrote down. It's more than a year ago, um, but it is in the, it is, I think it was number 38 in my, talks and we're up to 150 right now. So I would put it maybe more than two years ago. I think it's in 2021. I, I noted the date down and I didn't write it here, but, but it is in the series. So, so I, and I didn't mention the other aspect, which I was going to, there are, so it's not that video games are unilaterally, wholly, completely bad, evil, rotting your brain. There are some studies suggesting there was a fascinating study, it's 15 years old now, looking at surgeons who were doing laparoscopic surgery and being trained on new laparoscopic, so going in through an incision. And, and the best 
a, or not the best, but a very good predictor of the surgeon's proficiency on these tools. So both substantially like 37% lower error rate, 22% faster doing times was how much time they'd been spending in the three months before on video games. So they also looked at current video game level, they looked at age, they looked at a bunch of other factors. Again, it didn't prove that those who were practicing on video games. But what's interesting with this study is that, I mean, one, again, it's suggesting a benefit from video gaming, but two, it's suggesting a translatable benefit. So, so many of the brain training algorithm or you know, tools out there, one, most of them don't provide any data as to how effective these really are in real or at all. Most of them that do present results show people being tested on pretty much the same exact task that the program is training you on. This one with video games and surgical laparoscopic technique and speed is again suggesting that that some of these skills are translatable in a much broader general way, which again, we would hope for, but hasn't been shown with most of the official game. So it's thank you for Dennis for pointing out that there can be advantages or benefits from video gaming. Um, so YouTube playlist is asked, I'm on 10 milligrams of Vyvanse. I'm worried that any higher dose will mean it'll build up a tolerance with no higher dose options. So should I stay on 10 milligrams until it completely stops working? So this is a topic I've talked on extensively. So I think I have I think tolerance is in the title, tolerance to medications. It's an area where we don't have a lot of data. We have complete discrepancy between the addiction field and the ADD field. The addiction experts say, Vyvanse, stimulant, everyone gets tolerance to stimulants. Everyone needs to keep escalating dose. That's why they have at least one of the reasons they have a potential for addiction. The ADD field says almost the opposite. And they'll say, yes, some people take some sorting out. It may take a few weeks or a few months to find the right dose. But once you find the optimal dose for your ADHD, by and large, most people continue on that dose for years and years. When I crunched my own numbers and I looked at more than 100 patients, this was during COVID, so a few years back, um, and I started with people who had been on a dose for a full year, so stable dose, looked at where they were another year into it. and my results were a little more than 80% of people were on the same dose. And of the 20% or less than 20 who changed their dose, pretty much equal amounts were going down versus going up. So in my own practice, and it could be, I have biases, I may share them explicitly or implicitly with patients. So, um, but my experience is most people don't need to keep going up and up on the dose. Um, so most of the experts would say you should probably, it makes most sense if you notice more benefit. To, so to increase your dosage until you're getting optimal benefits, um, or many of them say actually go higher. And then if you're not seeing any increase at the next increment up to back down and go with that dose, if that's fully effective, that you know, if someone came in with depression, we wouldn't say, let's just treat half your depression or get you partly better only so you're crying two hours a day instead of four hours. Or if you come in with, you know, you were in a car accident and have your left leg and your right leg broken, we're not going to say, eh, today we're only fixing left legs. You know, you'll make do with the right leg for the next month or so. So there's an argument against partially or only halfway treating your condition. And again, I mean, if you're at 10, you are at the lowest dose. Or remember with Vyvanse, only about a third of that is active amphetamine, dextroamphetamine. The other two thirds are lysine. So 10 milligrams is equivalent to three, four milligrams of Adderall. Pretty small dose. The Vyvanse goes all the way up to 70 and in 10 milligram increments. So I'm not making any specific advice. I don't have a medical relationship with you, but theoretically, 10 is pretty low. If you would substantially benefit from more, most experts, unless there's other factors going on that I'm not aware of, would recommend that it would be reasonable to try more. And 
the likeliest expectation is that it should keep working. Um, so YouTube playlist also has a question, should I take medication holidays on the weekend? So I do have another video. I think drug holidays is in the title specifically on that topic. Um, and the amazing thing when I did the research there for years, for decades now, the claim has been go on holidays, reduce the risk of tolerance, um, reduce the risk of addiction, reduce the risk of other bad problems. Not a single study systematically looks for any of those benefits. It's potentially logical, it may be true, um, but nothing supports that claim. Um, the only benefit, and this is with drug holidays over extended periods of time, like including months over the summer, drug holidays mitigated, lessened the effect of height decrements in kids. So kids on stimulants, Ritalin and Adderall been the ones most studied, on average wind up, I think it's an inch or two shorter. It's not a huge effect, but if you're on the short side to begin with, that may be feeling impairing or embarrassing or socially difficult. Um, so it's not a huge effect, but that effect is lessened by months long breaks during the summer, at least. So extensive drug holidays. Um, so, so the argument against drug holidays is that ADHD is something that doesn't just affect job performance or school of performance. It's not a purely cognitive, it affects social interactions. And if you, if the drugs are helping you be your best self, then why wouldn't you want to be your best self weekends as well as weekdays? Now, if you're functioning fine, if things are going great on the weekends without it, I, I usually support the less medication intake, the better. Um, but if it's really helping you function and the people to ask would be your family, your friends, your partner, the people around you, can you see a difference when I'm taking it or not? It may be in your best if it's just to take it on weekends as well. Um, so Eugene says, I can't pay attention to movies or participate in conversations. Um, so I didn't address, so it's, I mean, there's, there's clearly a social or, or people who have more difficult or challenges in social interactions are more attracted to the gaming environment where they're not as often put in awkward positions or missing information. Um, they still may be missing some information, but, but people have looked at social and anxiety and other factors as well contributing to it. So Alex says, hi, hi, Alex, I'm not watching live, just started the stream now. What are your thoughts on the idea of dopamine detox and desensitization due to gaming? Um, so again, with gaming, there have been studies looking at, I mean, there are, there are some studies that would support there is desensitization. Again, the difficult thing to sort out is were these people who are already prone to ADHD or already, was, was desensitization what actually led to gaming or was it gaming that led to desensitization? There may be clear cut, robust studies that more definitely parse it out. But again, I think most of the problem is it's hard to sort out. You know, we, can, we can measure correlations well and lots of the time we're not doing designing studies well to look at what's causation. Um, Yeah, so, so Alex is going on it. Yes, there's a logic that highly stimulating activities could well downregulate the receptors. And again, I've, I've tried to delve into it and I certainly have much more reading to do. I don't know how extensively we've actually shown that over the course of weeks or months or whatever of gaming, that there's down regulation and there's up. It, someone may well have already shown it and there are interesting studies. Again, this isn't with gaming, this is more just with social media. There was a study done a few years ago and maybe I'll talk more about it next week. Um, kids just forced to go to an outdoor, and I, I'm an outdoor nature boy nerd before I got into the rest of science. Um, so I approve of this entirely. Um, but it was comparing a class that went to nature immersion camp 
completely no phones, no computers, no tech at all. And this was looking mostly at ability to detect emotions in others and not emotional regulation. Um, and just a week of detox and maybe much more hours spent on social interaction measurably improved emotional processing in these kids. So clearly fairly short-term detoxes can have some measurable effect. This, they were only looking at psychometric studies and not any neurochemistry in that, but so now I'm even losing track of where I am with the questions, Alex. Is going, if someone does take drug holidays, it should pay. So I think Alex is offering some help or advice to YouTube. If someone does take drug holidays, they should pay close attention to the behavior during those times. Skipping meds that help manage impulsivity could theoretically lead to risk taking. So, I mean, we have a wealth of data that from car accident crashes, and I think some of it's even in the suicidality talk I gave. You know, bad things that we know are statistically more likely to happen with people with ADHD are absolutely tied to when they're taking their drugs or not taking their drugs. So more car crashes or, or reduced rates of car crashes if you're in the days or weeks you are taking your medication and higher rates when you're not. So yes, there can be severe consequences to not taking your medication. The other big argument people offer for not skipping any days is that part of ADHD is inconsistency. And meds look the same, taste the same. Why would you remember an hour or two later whether you took it or not? If you are in the habit or training yourself that some days I'm taking it, some days I'm not, if you didn't take it Saturday, Sunday, it makes it much more likely that come around Monday morning, you forget your medications because that's what you've, you've gotten out of practice. So that's one other argument that's given for being consistent. Um, so, yep, yeah, so YouTube playlist is also endorsing being outdoors and in nature. I do have a talk on that, that, that there is some good data in terms of mitigating ADHD symptoms and sports as well. So substantial data also on physical activity, helping mitigate ADHD symptoms. Yeah, so, so yeah, that's one of my object with, with the study that was published that I was reciting the, a, a week in the nature camp that the authors go on and on and on about how it's all due to one-on-one -on -one, increase in one-on-one -on -one face to face interaction with people. Um, they documented the kids were spending about four hours a day on with screen time before and, and none during this interaction. And they sort of, in one line, I think, dismissed that being in nature would have any ability to improve emotions because being in nature is a solitary activity. And um, I, uh, I object strongly to their conclusions and, and, and there's way too many compounding. I mean, just being away from your own home school, even if it isn't in nature, most kids are in a better mood. That's cool, that's a trip away, that's something fun. And yes, they were, there was instruction, there was learning on this. So it was you know, not a complete holiday from school, but it could be as simple as those factors and not the change from that screen exposure that led to the results they saw in that study. Um, um, so, YouTube playlist also says, yeah, my weekends are a mess. Um, so thinking I'm taking, so that highlights, and I think this will be the last question. In my book, Recognizing Adult ADHD, I think there was a sub hat I'd acquainted over the years was, if you have ADHD, free time is your enemy. I'm being a little flippant then, I'm a big fan of having downtime, me time, fun time, but if it's unstructured, if it's unplanned, so the common, Thing with many people with ADHD, if you have school or if you have work during the work days, you may like it, you may not, but you have structure. You have the boss, you have your colleagues, you have your cohort. Scheduling sort of and reinforcing what you're doing hour to hour. Now working from home, there's less of that, but still some. And for most of us, our expectations of how much we're gonna enjoy our work week, I love my work, so I'm a weirdo that way. Um, but if we, 
So expectations are lower and we have structure in place. On the weekend, weekend comes around, hey, I could clean out the closets. I could go to the beach. I could call up my friend I haven't talked to in two years. I could do 401 things. And then you spend the whole weekend dithering. I could have done that. I could do that. I could, maybe I could go to the gym. Maybe I'll... there's no structure, no guidance. And at the end of the weekend, your colleagues say, oh, how was your weekend? Everyone's expecting you did something fun and wonderful and enjoyable. So the discrepancy between expectations and actuality leads to many people with ADHD, the weekends wind up being much worse than the weekdays. So, um, so the sound just got cut off. Um, I will try to, so maybe it came back on. I am dependent on Elon Musk and his marvelous Starlink system. I'm being somewhat flippant there with marvelous. Um, actually it's, certainly providing some people who never had any access, whether internet to the access to the internet's a good thing or bad thing. We touched on some of it today, um, but I'm in a rural part of the big island of Hawaii and unlike over much of Europe and North America where Elon has parked lots and lots of it and they're not parked, they're not geosynchronous. They swap, they move around and swap information between them. Um, Connectivity here is not that great. It's much better than no connectivity, but calls get dropped a lot. There's breaks and interruptions. So that's what I have to deal with. So have a stay healthy, stay happy. I will be back next week talking about Wellbutrin, Bupropion, and ADHD. That's all. <laughs>